Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are located in the world. And thank you for joining us for this Amatex Solid State Controls IGBT Inverted Design um, webinar. And it is the 20th of March, and uh, uh, welcome along. So what I'm going to do is wait just a moment and... Um, <sighs> see if everybody who signed up arrives and then we will get started but the first thing i always like to ask everybody is can you hear me so if you can hear me if you can use the chat bar on the right and just say yes um obviously if you can't hear me then you can't hear me asking this question so you can't say no but um i'll just wait to make sure that i can be heard before i go any further Perfect. You can hear me loud and clear. That is always a good thing if you're doing a webinar. <laughs> so first of all, let's get some introductions done. My name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager for Amatic Solid State Controls based in the Stafford office, which is just southwest of Houston, Texas. Um, I've been in the industrial UPS industry for actually it's nearly 23 years now. Uh, I've worked with all the major UPS charger manufacturers that are out there uh, in the industrial side of things. Um, and I've been with Amatex All State Controls for seven years now. Uh, there will be a lag of around 30 seconds um, between you hearing my voice and me seeing a question, because basically we use a platform called Webinar Jam, and they have got to convert this signal into Android, iOS, and Windows-based platforms, whichever version you're um, watching this on. And that takes some processing time, and it's done on the cloud. So there is approximately a 15 to 30 second delay. So you know, when I speak, you're not going to hear it until 15 to 30 seconds later, which means if you have a question on the topic, I'm not going to see you type that question in for about 15 to 30 seconds. So what we ask that you do is uh, if you have any questions, type it into the Q and A bar. If you go to the chat bar, there is two tabs at the top. One says chat, one says Q and A only. So if you have a question, type it in the Q&A only section. And then when we get to the end of the webinar, um, I will go over each question and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Um, another question that gets asked a lot is, will the webinar be recorded? And yes, absolutely. Um, webinar Jam automatically records uh, the webinar. And if you have registered for the webinar, you'll, you will be sent a link uh, to be able to replay that webinar. The problem with the, the link that Webinar Jam sends out is that it's treated like a brand new webinar, basically. You can go, you can press play, and then that's it. You can't rewind, you can't fast forward. I think you can pause, but you, know, you can't move around uh, like you can in a YouTube video. So our wonderful marketing team, which is London, um, she comes in and she takes that webinar jam video and she converts it to an mp4 uploads it to our uh, amatex solid state controls youtube site and then you can share it watch it do whatever you want with it um, to your heart's content um, and if you go to the amatex solid state controls youtube site you will find every single webinar that we have presented over the last few years and you can watch them um, at your leisure. Okay. Um, also, Webinar Jam does have a panic button. So if something happens to the webinar and I say, if I see comments saying that you can't hear me or something obviously goes wrong, I can press the panic button and then that will automatically create a new room. Everybody will be invited to the new room and we will carry on as if nothing happened. And lastly, the webinar should last around about one hour, depending A, on how much I talk, which can vary tremendously <laughs> and how many questions I get asked at the end also. Okay. So what we will do is we will get started. So the learning outcome today is going to be understanding the 2D SCI designs of Inverter Bridge. 
discuss the components used. We are going to discuss desaturation today, and then we're going to explain the benefits of each of the designs that Amatex Solid State Controls um, builds. So that is what we're going to discuss today. So first of all, <clears throat> what is an inverter? Um, we need to get that out of the way before we go any further. So an inverter converts DC, which is on this side here, that would go into this connection here, excuse my poor drawing abilities. And then on the output here, we would want to see a sine wave. Uh, let me just move this so I get a better uh, drawing. There we go there. So that's basically what an inverter does. It takes DC and it doesn't care where the DC comes from, whether it's from a rectifier or a battery. Um, it doesn't care. As long as it has the applicable DC going in, it will take that DC and convert it to AC. Now, obviously, in North America, we want to create a 60 hertz um, sine wave. In other places, it could be 50 hertz. And then we can also um, create different voltages um, quite easily. So that is the basics of what an inverter does. It converts DC into AC. OK. And there's many ways that you can do that. But the most popular method out there is what's called an H bridge. OK, so on the left hand side, we have our positive and our negative. So that's our DC going in on the left hand side. OK, and then I said it was an H bridge. Um, you can see this, this similarity of the letter H there. So that's where it's derived from. That's why it's called an H bridge. Let me put this back again, DC. And then the easiest way to show you, in my opinion, how um, an inverter bridge works is by using a DC motor. OK, so we have a DC motor um, at this mid, uh, midpoint here. OK, and what we're going to do is we're going to close switch one and switch four. OK, you can see that we now have a path to that motor so that that now creates a field on this motor positive on the left hand side. And negative on the right hand side, because you can see if we start at this point here, you will get to this point here through that switch and you will have positive on this side of the motor. And the negative will go down and connect to the negative of the battery that side. So what we are saying is that if that is the way that we have the motor connected, then the motor will turn clockwise in, in this situation. So um, that gives us movement in one direction. But any, if it was current or movement in one direction, that's DC. That's still DC. What we want to do is create AC. So very cleverly with the H bridge arrangement, if we turn off S1 and S4 and then turn on uh, S3 and S2, so you can see S1 and S4, they've been switched off. They're now open. And now we have turned on S3 and S2. And we still have our positive over here. But now the power flows here. It can't go down this way here because the switch is open. So now it goes down to this point here and it makes this side of the motor positive. And then we have our negative here. You can follow that through switch two up here to this point on the motor. And that makes it negative. So we have switched the polarity on that motor. Uh, and in doing so, we have changed the direction of the motor. It now will uh, turn counterclockwise. So just by using two switch, uh, sorry, four switches and having two switch at the same time in different um, modalities, then it will change the direction of the motor. And that's exactly the principle that we use to convert DC into AC. And instead of a motor, we use a, uh, a transformer. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Now, you do have to be careful when uh, you are switching uh, DC into AC for what's called shoot through. Uh, there it is there. Shoot through happens when you have these two switches turn on at the same time, which means you have a direct short across the power supply, whether that's a battery or the DC. 
okay and that would be a very bad situation um indeed it would give uh, a short circuit which would cause high current to flow and can damage components uh, uh, and it could actually cause things to go on fire so there's always things um circuit design put in place to prevent shoot through uh, from happening okay so the next thing that we need to discuss is okay with switches switches have moving parts they have contacts um, they are slow to open and close so we can't use those in, in an inverter bridge it just wouldn't work for us so we have to use a certain type of semiconductor and the semiconductor that we choose to uh, choose to use is an igbt some people call them igbits but uh, we in the, the the industrial ups business usually call them igbts okay and that is an insulated gate bipolar transistor okay and you can see why it says insulated gate because you can see there is an actual physical gap between the gate, which is this terminal here, and the collector emitter. There's actually no physical electrical connection between the gate to the collector emitter circuit, okay? So that's why it's called an insulated gate bipolar transistor. So really what, what happens is they, they use the, the gate drive of a MOSFET uh, which gives us isolation and it's voltage controlled. And we use the collector emitter of a bipolar transistor. So that's why we get insulated gate, which is the MOSFET side, and bipolar transistor is the collector emitter side. Hopefully that explains what an IGBT is. <laughs> and my very simple uh, circuit equivalent, now don't do this obviously because you don't want to put your finger on electricity, but it gives you a good idea of how um, an IGBT works because we use them in inverters as switches. So we have our collector terminal here, our emitter terminal here, and our finger is the gate and we have a spring loaded switch here. So if you have no gate signal, then the switch is not pushed down, so therefore current cannot flow from the collector to the emitter because these contacts here are open, okay? So when you have no gate signal, then no current can flow from collector to emitter. But, oh, sorry. But when you press this button and you make these contacts here, you send a gate signal to the IGBT, then current will flow through the collector emitter. And then once again, when you take your finger off the gate or when the gate signal is removed, then the collector emitter junction is broken again and it becomes open. So it's like a very fast acting switch, obviously, with this picture here, it's not fast acting because it's a spring loaded switch, but electronically inside an IGBT, that's basically what is going on. And here is what power inverter modules look like. They, they're quite sizable. Um, they're about the size of a, a man's wallet um, for the IGBTs that we use inside our UPS systems. And, and there's obviously various different versions. Um, this one here is a single IGBT. So one of these will be the collector. This will be the emitter. And then we have our gate emitter uh, signals going into these terminals here. This top right one here actually has two IGBTs in it. You can see very faintly that on the side of the device itself, it has two IGBTs um, drawn there. And basically the collector and the emitter for one is connected on that middle one. And then this one here will be the uh, emitter for one, and this one here will be the collector for the other, or vice versa. And then these two pins here are the gate drives for that IGBT. Okay, so that is what IGBTs physically look like inside uh, a power UPS. Okay, this is what they shouldn't look like inside a power UPS. Yes, please try not 
to do this. This is what happens when too much current flows through an IGBT. Um, it destroys itself. They're very, very sensitive devices to high current. Um, and unlike SCRs, which can tolerate a high amount of current, fault current, IGBTs will pretty much blow themselves to pieces when they have higher than the acceptable current going through it. So try not to do that. So now we're going to move on to the first design of Amatex solid state control UPSs that we use, and it's called the micro ferro design. Um, so this is this part here is a constant voltage transformer or a ferro resonant transformer. Okay, it's a little bit complicated. When we get to the next slide, you'll see what's going on. But these two switches here are basically representations of the IGBT, okay? And if you follow this drawing here, you'll see what's going on in just a moment. So we have our positive from the DC here, and we have our negative from the DC there, okay? So it says here, if we have S1 at the top, if we have S1 closed and S2 open, well, positive will go to the center tap of the transformer here. And if S1 is closed, that allows a path through this transformer down to the negative of the system. So that will make the center point of this transformer here positive with respect to negative on the bottom of the transformer. Okay. And then if we close S2, we still have positive and negative here. Now what happens is we can go down this way on the transformer and it creates positive here with respect to negative here okay so just like when we had that stepper motor uh, going one way and then we're reversing the direction what we're doing here is we're reversing the direction of the voltage going into the primary of that transformer hopefully this next screen will help you uh, even better to see what's going on. Once again, we've got our positive and we've got our negative, but now instead of switches, we've got IGBTs, Q1 and Q2. So in the first circumstance, we have our positive coming through to the center point of this transformer here. And if Q1 is on, then we create this path down to negative which makes positive here on the transformer, negative here on the transformer. And then if we turn Q2 on, once again, we go down to the center point of the transformer, and now we have positive with respect to negative on that part of the transformer. It's all the way through that back to the... So basically, the input to that transformer, the primary of the transformer, is going to be a square wave. You can see that on this screen here. Now, obviously, it's important to know uh, where the start and finish of the windings of the transformer are. I'm not going to go into that today. But the primary of the transformer is a square wave. And then what happens is that goes into the transformer, which has some uh, inductive um, filtering. And there's also in the CVT, there is a, a tank capacitor in the CVT circuit. And basically that filters out that uh, square wave and turns it into a relatively nice sine wave. Just like that. So we have a square wave into the primary of the transformer. And then on the secondary of the transformer, you will get the sine wave. Hopefully, that makes sense. Now, this is a very busy drawing. I, I understand that. And obviously, on your screen, depending on what you're watching this on, it's going to be very difficult for you to ascertain what is going on. But this is a drawing from uh, an actual Amatec SCI UPS. And you can see this point here. This is the positive, And this point here is the negative. Now, that will come from the charger and the battery in the system that the inverter is connected to, okay? 
So we'll follow the positive through to this point here, okay? And then we'll follow the negative through to this point here. We don't have to worry about all this uh, other stuff that's in this part of the drawing here. It's just going to show you where the IGBTs are. So in this system, um, this is probably a 20 kVA UPS because we've got two IGBTs here. We've got Q1 and Q3 here, and then we've got Q2 and Q4 here. So to get more power, we just put IGBTs in parallel. So, but then what we're going to do, here's the center point of the transformer here. So you can see the transformer at this point here. We're going to turn Q1 and Q3 on. And once again, just to drive the theory home, we're going to go down here, get to this point here, and we're going to go through this transformer winding back that way to the negative, okay? So that center point there would be positive with respect to negative there. Okay, I'm going to have to clear the screen now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to switch Q2 and Q4 on. So we're going to switch these ones on. That's going to make that positive. We're going to allow that to go down through that point there. We're going to get to that point there and go back to the negative. So that makes that point there positive with respect to negative there. Okay. And once again, don't get hung up on all these windings because that's the action of the CVT uh, transformer. But basically, we've got a square wave going in at that point there. And because of the capacitor here and all this inductive uh properties of the coils on the CVT, the output of this system is going to be a sine wave. So you can see from DC here, we have now created AC on the output. So this circuit here is our inverter bridge for a microfarad UPS system. Okay. And on our modern microfarad systems, um, we do actually adjust the size of the, the, sorry, the width of the square wave. This is not pulse width modulation. Do not get this confused with pulse width modulation. But we do adjust the size of the pulse. And basically, it's because we want the power going into the primary of the transformer to be the same as the power required on the secondary of transformer. And we have to have parameters for the DC that goes into the inverter bridge, and they're driven by the battery. Now, a lead acid battery, uh, a 60 cell lead acid battery, needs to be charged at approximately 135 volts DC um, for 77 degree Fahrenheit operation. Okay. So, therefore, in normal operation, the charger and the battery is going to be putting out 135 volts DC. But the, char the, the battery manufacturer usually will stipulate for a wet cell battery that it should be able to be equalized charged at 140 volts DC, okay, which you can see is this point up here. And also, when the power fails, the battery is going to start to discharge. And that battery will discharge down to a safe level, which is 105 volts DC. And then the system will disconnect the battery because um, we want to prevent over discharge of that battery, which could cause irreparable um, damage to the battery. Um, so therefore, the window that we work in for a 60 cell lead acid battery is 140 volts and 105 volts. So that is the window that the UPS will work at. Well, we're using the area under the square wave um, to generate our width of pulse. I don't, I know I said it's not pulse with modulation. It's not, it's just the width of these pulses here. So for, here's the easy calculation. So let's just say, for example, that at 105 volts, the width of the pulse, pulse is 10 milliseconds. That's a very easy math, um, and it's a rectangle. So it's 105 times 10, 
which is equal to 1050. So the question is, what is the width of the pulse when it's 140 volts DC? Well, that's quite easy. It's 100, uh, sorry, 1050 divided by 140, which is equal to 7.5 milliseconds. Okay, so you can see that for anywhere between 140, so this would be 7.5 milliseconds, our system is always looking to um, change the trailing edge of the pulse of the square wave to keep the area under the square wave uh, the same. Um, so the same amount of energy being supplied to the transformer from the DC from high line to low line. Hopefully that made sense. So that is our microferro, or our, um, some people call it the, the SE or the DSE systems that use the ferroresonant constant voltage transformers. Now we're going to move on to the DPP. Okay, this is our newer um, technology, and this does use pulse width modulation in an H bridge design. So uh, you can see it's a much different design. We use instead in the previous one, we used two IGBTs. We're now using four IGBTs to be able to switch the DC into AC. And once again, we've got positive and negative on the left hand side. That's our DC going in. And then on the output, we have our sine wave coming out. OK. And once again, we're switching um in pairs so this pair is a and a so if we switch igbt a on you can see the flow from the positive it goes this way down through igbt a and it will make this part of the transformer positive and then you can follow the negative um, back through this igbt here and you will see the polarity of the transformer at that point there is positive with respect to negative. Positive is on the top, negative is on the bottom. OK. Hopefully that makes sense. And then all we do is switch IGBTs A off and we switch IGBTs B on. And here's where the difference happens. This is the, how clever an H bridge is because it's so simple. Now we go through, instead of going through A, we're not going through that way anymore, we're going through B. And that's connected to this side of the transformer. So that now makes that part of the transformer positive with respect to this side, because that is the side that's now connected to the negative. So in theory, if we switched that at 60 Hertz, we would still create a 60 Hertz waveform on the input and then with some filtering we would have a sinusoidal waveform on the output but that's not what we do because igbts are very easy to switch very quickly we can use what's called pulse width modulation so pulse width modulation confuses a lot of people on how it is created okay so first of all modulation uh, in electronics and telecommunications telecommunications, thank you Wikipedia for this, is the process of varying one or more properties of a periodic waveform called the carrier signal with a modulating signal that typically contains the information to be transmitted. So that's a lot of words on the screen. That doesn't mean a lot to people. Waveforms always tend to um, drive home the point. So this is amplitude modulation, okay? So this is a carrier signal at the top, okay, the carrier signal. So let's say for AM amplitude mod, let's say that that's uh, uh, 850 kilohertz, okay? That frequency does not change. 850 kilohertz is the carrier signal. And then the modulating sine wave signal, that's the signal that we're sending over the carrier waveform, okay? And when you add the two together, you can see here, that the, the peaks of each of these sine waves has changed. The amplitude has changed. But if you count each of the zero crossing points, they're all the same. So the frequency has remained the same. Only the amplitude has changed. 
So that's what amplitude modulation means. And then obviously when this goes, this signal goes into the receiver, it will have some filtering. I said that this carry away form was 850 kilohertz. So they will have a filtering system on the receiver here that filters out 850 kilohertz and you will be left with that uh, modulated, a modulating sine wave signal at the end. That's how AM radio works. Now, frequency modulation is different. Once again, we've got our carrier signal at the top here. That's our carrier signal. And this is the sine wave signal that we want to send uh, on top of the carrier signal. And you can see now that the amplitude it is not changing. OK, so the amplitude stays the same. What is changing now is what they're doing is they're adding together the carrier signal and the modulating signal, and the frequency is changing. You can see here that the it's quite wide open, the sine wave there. But once we get to this point here, the sine waves are really, really close together. So we are changing the frequency by adding the top and the middle waveform together. And that's what FM is, frequency modulation. And that was an animated version of it, but unfortunately it doesn't work on this presentation. But now we're gonna move on to pulse width modulation. And it's a little bit more difficult to explain, but hopefully I can do it for you. So once again, so this is a pulse width modulated waveform. Forget about the sine wave just now. And just look at the green waveform that's on your screen. You can see that the amplitude of this does not change, okay? And if you looked very carefully, the frequency doesn't change either. Although it kind of looks like it does, if you look at the center point of each of these individual pulses, the frequency is not changing at all, okay? So neither the amplitude is changing nor the frequency is changing. For pulse width modulation, what we're actually doing is we are changing the width of each pulse. You can see here that this first pulse here is just a very, very thin line. But when you move into the center of this waveform, you can see that there is a much bigger pulse. OK, and then when we get to the end, the pulse turns into a very small pulse again. It's just like a single line. That is what pulse width modulation is doing. We can vary the pulse of each individual pulse within the waveform. Now, don't get me wrong. So the way that it's drawn here, it's not, but our pulse mo width modulation is at eight kilohertz. So that means we have 8,000 pulses per second, okay? But this, you can, let's look at this as a square wave. We're still creating 60 hertz in this portion here, but split up into its own individual pulses, we have eight kilohertz, um, 8,000 times per second, okay? Hopefully that explains what's going on there. So once again, back to our H bridge. The diagram below shows that the output of that bridge will look before the primary of the transformer and on the secondary of the transformer. So once again, I've shown you these pulses and now you can see the pulses getting thicker and thicker as they get to the middle of uh, the waveform and then it gets thinner at the end. And then if you do a mathematical representation of this pulse wa wave modulated waveform, it does basically resemble a sine wave. And then all we do is actually make, let me go the other way, my apologies. All we do is we have a choke, which is sometimes incorporated into the uh, winding of the transformer. And then this capacitor here, that will change the pulse width modulated uh, waveform into the transformer and the filtering 
will create a beautiful synthetically generated sine wave on the output. Okay. And once again, to show you it in one of our Amatech SEI drawings, this is the exact same H bridge. Um, and in this circumstance here, once again, we have put two pairs of IGBTs in parallel, um, but we still would have Q1, Q3, Q2, and Q4. You can treat them as basically one IGBT each, okay? Uh, my drawings are quite poor, but just because we put them in parallel, and in truth, we can put up to about six, maybe even eight, I can't remember what the maximum IGBTs that we put in parallel are to get higher capacity ratings out of our uh, UPSs. But what I'm gonna do is, if we turn on this pair and this pair, you can see the power flows down to this point here, positive. It will go along here, out to this side of the transformer. So that will be positive. And then if we follow this back up along here, down here, and then back up, sorry, we're needing to get to the negative. Uh, I'm half my screen is missing. So it goes down, basically follow this, Back, there it is there. It goes down through this point here, down through Q4. Let me draw that again. So down, along here, down here, that goes here, that's positive, up. That's what it is, it's going down to this point here, and then it goes through that transistor out there, because it's quite small on my screen as well. So that's positive with respect to negative there. And then when we do it the other way around and we turn this one on and this one on, power comes from the DC down through here, down to this point here, which then goes up. And it makes that side of the transformer positive. And then we go down uh, here through that IGBT back to the negative. And that makes that side of the transformer negative. So hopefully you can see that's a positive and the negative getting switched around with the H bridge. Now the problem with IGBTs, are that, I mentioned it earlier, they are extremely sensitive to high current and a fuse is not fast enough to protect the IGBT. In near enough all circumstances, the IGBT will blow up before a fuse ruptures and prevents the high current uh, going through the device. So we have to come up with a way to try and prevent the IGBT from being damaged um, when there is a fault. And the way that we do that is by using what's called a desaturation circuit. Okay. And what a desaturation circuit does is it uses um, a method of monitoring the voltage across the collector emitter of the IGBT when the IGBT is switched on, and that's done on the gate drive PCB. So you can see here, we have our gate drive PCB here. We have, that generates the gate signal to the IGBT to turn it on. And then we have this point here and this point here, which is the collector and the emitter. We're gonna monitor the voltage across the collector emitter, okay? So when we send this signal, turns the gate on, current will flow from the collector through the emitter. That's what should happen when you turn the gate signal to the IGBT on. And what the gate drive sensing circuit does is it's saying, well, with an IGBT, it's not a perfect device. A lot of people think that if you turn an IGBT on and you measure across the collector and the emitter, that you, you should see zero volts because it should be a perfect switch. That's not the case. Basically, it, it, it's a semiconductor, so it has some voltage drop across it. And what the desaturation uh, sensing circuit does is it says as long as the voltage across the collector emitter is below nine volts, which is considered still in its saturation region, in other words, still 
in the region of the IGBT that is normal, then everything is good. It says, I'm okay with that. I'm gonna continue sending gate signals to this IGBT. We're all good. But if for some reason there is too much current flowing through this IGBT, it will go out of its saturation region. It will become desaturated. And when that happens, the voltage across the collector and the emitter, when there is a gate signal sent to it, will be greater than nine volts. And what our electronic sensing circuit does is, as soon as it sees a collector emitter voltage go above nine volts, it says, nope, I'm going to switch this IGBT off. And then hopefully that is done quick enough to prevent that high current that was flowing through the IGBT and taking it out of its uh, saturation region and will prevent it from damaging itself. That is the only circuit that is possible to turn off the IGBT quick enough to prevent it from damaging itself. And it doesn't work all of the time, depending on how much current um, is being seen. Okay, so that is how the system looks at the desaturation of the IGBT. And once again, here's the same H bridge. I've blown it up for you. Here is Q1 and here is Q2. And the way that it senses it is the collector is sensed at this pin here. And then the collector emitter of both IGBTs is sensed at that pin there. And then the emitter is sensed at that pin there. So if it sees nine volts or greater at that point there, it will turn this gate signal off. And once again, if it sees more than nine volts there, it will turn the gate signal to that IGBT off. So that is what desaturation means. So what's the benefits of the two types of bridges? If you remember, we started this presentation off with the uh, microferro version, which just uses two transistors and uses a center tap transformer on a CBT transformer. The benefits of that circuit is that it's a much simpler control circuit. It basically tells the IGPTs to switch on and off. It's 60 hertz or 50 hertz if you're in other countries. There's no other complex regulation circuits. There's no, there's no voltage feedback. There's really no current feedback. All the circuit has to do is turn the IGPTs on at, at 60 hertz. It's very, very... It's not simple, but it's much less complex than a PWM circuit, okay? It's also very robust because the regulation is not performed by the inverter circuit. It's actually performed by the ferro, the microferro constant voltage transformer, which is 80 year old technology that is tried and tested and it's just bulletproof. It also has excellent fault clearing capabilities. Um, the ferro transformer can supply in excess of 500% of the rated current for a very short time and clear many, many faults um, which would probably damage the a PWM bridge if the bypass wasn't available and it had to try and supply those currents in some circumstances, not in our IGBT uh, inverter bridge designs. But it's just much more robust. It can clear much higher uh, faults. Also, the CVT has stored energy. Uh, that's kind of a complex um, theory to get into your head that a transformer has stored energy, but it does because of the tank capacitor circuit and the, the, the way that the windings are designed. There is some stored energy in the transformer. And what will happen is if there is a fault downstream um, at one of your load circuits, then it's actually not the IGBT that will supply that fault current to the, to the fault. It will actually be the stored energy in the transformer. So therefore we can get the uh, IGBTs shut down, sensing that high current, and then it will be the transformer that does the work and feeds the, the fault current. And hopefully that would prevent the IGBTs from, from being damaged, okay? And the bridge design has been proven reliable for many, many decades. So that's the benefits of 
the microfarad bridge or the DSE bridge, okay? And the benefits of the DPP bridge, which is our modern PWM technology, is that it provides a near perfect sinusoidal waveform with much tighter regulation. And what we mean by tighter regulation is um, if you put uh, an oscilloscope on the output of the UPS and you did certain load steps, you should see very little change in the output voltage waveform. Um, it has much tighter regulation and the sinusoidal waveform is much more is much cleaner, there's less distortion. It's also more efficient. Um, the way that a CVT transformer works is it needs to be uh, saturated to stay in its constant voltage region. So in other words, it does have to be, um, th there's, there's energy used in that process that is inefficient. Um, but with a PWM system, we don't have to saturate the transformer and therefore um, it's much more efficient operation. Also, we don't need as much magnetics in a PWM system as we do for a CVT system. So um, it's a smaller footprint for this newer design of technology. Also, there are a wider range of alarm options because we're using uh, microprocessors and much more complex monitoring circuits. There are much more alarms and monitoring points used in a DPP system. Also, greater flexibility for communications, Ethernet, Internet, Modbus, all these kind of things. Um, the DPP has much more flexibility with that. Although the, the DSC that we make with the microfarad transformer, with the ferro transformer, sorry, um, does have the ability to connect via Ethernet, Internet, all those things too. And also better dynamic response to load steps. So the two technologies both have their benefits, um, both have their downsides as well. Um, and if you speak to your distributor or your sales guy, they will be able to point you in the, the, the best direction for your application um, if you require to know which type of UPS you should use. So now we get to the fun part. If everybody, if anybody has any questions. So let me check in the questions. Okay. First question I see, uh, and remember, if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A bar and I will try and answer them for you. So the first question is from Eric. How often do the IGBTs need to be re replaced during the life of the inverter? So Amatex solid state controls do not recommend that semiconductor devices are replaced as part of routine maintenance. Um, they are very reliable, very um, robust, um, and they should not fail. And there's no degradation um, that we have seen that happens with age with IGBTs. So um, our recommendation is you do not um, replace the IGBTs unless they fail. So that is our recommendation. Question from Michael. We mentioned SCRs briefly. Why do we use IGBTs over SCRs? So in truth, Michael, for our original uh, ferroresonant inverter bridges, we did use SCRs. We used what's called a forced commutation bridge. Um, it's a very complex bridge because with an SCR, you cannot switch an SCR off. With an IGBT, you can switch it on and you can switch it off. An SCR only switches off when there is no voltage across the anode or cathode or there's no current flowing through it. So we, when you have DC going through an SCR, once you turn that SCR on, that DC will flow forever. So we had to force commutate that bridge off. Uh, and to do so is kind of complex. There's high currents involved. Um, uh, and it was much easier when IGBTs um, really came into their own in the 80s and 90s, and you've got higher power IGBTs. It's just much simpler 
to use IGBTs rather than SCRs um, because you can switch the, the IGBT off by removing its gate signal. So it's a very good question. Um, it's just technological breakthroughs has allowed it IGBTs to be used. Okay, let me go to the chat, see if there's any. Uh, what is the benefit to the two IGBT setup versus the four IGBT configuration? Basically, uh, there's really no benefit. It's just that the fact that when we use the center tap transformer for the Faro design of systems, um, you only require two IGBTs, but for the H-Bridge PWM design, you must have four IGBTs because you have to switch them on uh, in pairs because you're not connecting to a center tap transformer, you're connecting to the, the top of the transformer and the bottom of the transformer. So it's just down to the design. And it's the same as a, a rectifier bridge. You can have a center tapped two SCR rectifier bridge, which will do the exact same thing as a uh, four SCR rectifier bridge or two SCRs and two diodes. But it's just down to um, making the circuit work with the least amount of components. And with the center tap version, you can use two IGBTs. With the H bridge, you must use four. So what I'll do um, while I'm waiting for any other questions to come in is I will say thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to uh, watch this webinar. I understand that everybody has such busy days these days and uh, the fact that you've taken an hour out of your day to listen to me um, talk uh, is really appreciated. Um, and we enjoy the fact that people come and uh, watch these presentations. Um, also, you will receive a survey as you always do. And I think it's question five or six in that survey um asks what topic would you like to see at the next webinar i do read those surveys i really do want to find out what topics you want me to discuss at the next webinar so please fill in that survey if you get it and tell me what topics you would like to see at the next webinar um another question that's come in is i've heard of one of the systems being easier to maintain does that sound correct um, I would say probably the microferro system is easier to work on. Um, I wouldn't say it's easier to maintain. It's just a, a simpler circuit, so it is easier to work on um, and is less complex. So that's the the one with the fair resonant transformer. It, it's an easier system to work on, but I wouldn't say it's easier to maintain. Uh, Mark has asked, what does the choke do again? The choke on the transformer is um, just for filtering. Um, basically, it's a, an LC circuit that's tuned to, to the frequency of the PWM and turns the PWM synthesized waveform into a perfect sinusoidal, well, near perfect sinusoidal waveform. So that is what the choke is doing on the uh, primary side of the transformer on the output of the IGBT bridge. It's different from what a choke does uh, in a charger. It's still filtering, it does it in a charger, um, but basically a choke just uh, resists a change in current and a, a capacitor resistor change in voltage and the two acting together, tuned to a certain frequency, uh, filter out certain uh, parts of a waveform. Okay. Let me see. Uh, somebody has asked, will I be sharing the slides? The slides will not be shared, the slides are proprietary, but the recording will be available on our YouTube site uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, give our marketing department a chance to convert that into an MP4. Um, London has already posted the YouTube link in our in the chat. 
So if you click on that link, it will take you to our YouTube site and you can see all of our webinars, including this one. Uh, also, uh, you can contact us if you have any questions or concerns. You see that our email address is sei.marketing at amatech.com, or you can call toll free at 1 800 635 7300, and we will get you taken care of. So, if we don't have any more questions, once again, I would just like to say thank you very, very much for um, watching this presentation. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are located. And until next time, thank you. Oh, one more question has just popped up. What is typical THD for the DSE and DPP design? That off the top of my head, I, I think for the... DSC it's 5% and for the DPP is 2%, but I would have to get, right, let me see, have I got the DSC paperwork here? Okay, yeah, for the DSC it's less than 5%. So I'm pretty sure for the DPP it is less than 2%. Okay, once again, thank you very much. Take care until next time, and hopefully we will see everybody in the April webinar, uh, which will be the third Wednesday of the month as usual. Take care until then. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Thank you.